So it's 105 today in Texas, plenty hot, definitely living out this idea of square body summer. <laughs> Hey y'all, it is time for another update. Square body summer, Rev5 suspension on the Suburban. I'm doing the off-road design front coilover conversion and here's kind of the basic update for it. This week, we're talking all about overlay plates, why I did these, what the kind of, what some of the benefits are and where you can get a set of your own. First of all, these plates, it's a five plate set where it can either tie to uh, any one of the steering box repair plates on the other side, we'll take a look at that, from off-road design, which is what I did. Uh, and then I also think it ties to the Smitty built one that has kind of like a different profile here at the edge. And that kind of brings in the story of how these were developed. Adam Dueling, who runs Dueling Design up in Michigan, uh, actually got the Smitty built repair plate thinking it was just like the off-road design one. And it had some minor differences. And he got that, put it on his wife's truck, and then developed this plate and this plate for the other side. Uh, I had, at the time, I was putting on my off-road design steering box brace, and so when I called him and said, hey, have you developed anything that looks like, you know, the profile of a Chevy frame? He said, actually, yes, I have, uh, but it doesn't tie to the off-road design steering box brace. So, you know, I volunteered and said, well, you know, send me the file, I'll cut it here on, on a friend of mine, his plasma table, make a couple of adjustments and send you back the DXF so that you can then, you know, now have two versions for all of your customers. And so in the course of that, he sent me that file. I made the adjustments as I described. I also made all these windows and then got started here on this third plate, windows, and, and this one's meant for coilover. He's making the final few adjustments so that you can put this on a leaf sprung rig as well. So that's how these were developed. You'll be able to buy a set of these through 4 by store, and uh, Adam has got them all designed up and they're, they're gonna be ready to go. So you can get a set of these for yourself. If you saw the last episode, uh, which if you haven't, I do explain why I'm doing these. I'll recap briefly that just, it's a way to add strength to the outside of the frame. You don't have to do it, it's purely elective. I will also emphasize if you have a cage in your truck or you're gonna cage it, these are redundant, you don't need them. You get all the chassis stiffness in the world by running a cage. Also, if you've boxed the inside of your frame, these, are, these don't really add a lot to that. Um, I have not yet boxed the inside of the frame. The advantage that these have is you don't have to pull the engine to put them in. What you do have to do is, you know, cut off everything on the outside, go slow, take your time to weld them. And I'd say if you're MIG welding, you can do them at a weekend. I TIG welded all of these and it took me uh, two weeks. So, and that's working nights and weekends and then all weekend long to make sure that everything is, is just right. Hot root pass, let everything cool, then a, a, a very not too hot cover pass just to get the profiles all filled in. I like these window plates because they are kind of like trussing, like, um, like a bridge and then it's built in these three sections so that if your frame, like mine on the other side, has a little bit of a tweak in it maybe, or is a little fatigued or has lived a tough life, you don't have to try and scab a whole thing in from front to back. You can just put in these three uh, and, and clamp them together. Now what I've got, I've got these three all burned in and you can see right here, this is just filler primer. Yes. I am that guy who will blast some filler primer over some of the plug wells just to make sure that this is really nice looking and smooth before you paint it. It takes very little extra effort, but has a nice big effect. And the reason that I like these is because these add a good bit of strength and you still get access to holes that you can screw in for your fuel lines, which are all over here. And they look cool. It's also kind of desert racy. Fits my whole kind of thing that I'm building the truck for. So uh, one thing to note, these fuel lines in here, I do have them loose. I spaced them out, oh, just a, you know, about a quarter inch from the frame and uh, put a plate in between the, the frame and the fuel lines to make sure that I didn't burn anything up in there or otherwise damage the fuel rail. And then these guys, these are where they all thread in. These are on different places in different trucks and they're not perfectly universal. So these are not drilled, you'll have to do this work. And then I, don't think you could MIG weld this. I think you'd have to make a bigger profile to MIG weld it. Cause I even got kind of low amps and just TIG welded that with a very small wire toward the very end. Heading to the other side, the 
steering box brace, uh, I had to make a couple of modifications in order to get this scallop accounted for. And, you know, so that means you change the plate here. This plate actually extends all the way over if you leave it alone. I needed to cut it shy. And then kind of based on that, I welded pretty good up on the inside of the frame here. And I'm gonna actually plate the inside here to make sure that that's a little bit stiffer. That is the same reason I put in this gus gusset right here was to try and further beefen up what is a shorter section of the rail right here and transfer some of the loading to what is really a very nice profile on this pannard bar that grabs all the way down to the bottom of the rail. Just once again, trying to box out and make this thing larger. I also added this taco gusset. These are real easy to make when you just use cardboard and cut out what's kind of a kite shaped. And of course you still reinstall your off-road design steering brace that from the back side of these two holes ties all the way down to here, triangulating it together. One other piece of detail that's kind of separate from this, but important. These come all the way down right up to the cab. And then I also put in these reinforcements in the body mounts to keep them from spreading. So that's all what I did. Let's take just a minute, even though this is a summary, to talk about how I did it, because I think that that's, this is all within the capability of us kind of regular guy gearheads. I started TIG welding uh, just over a year ago and have really just dove in and started practicing a lot. So outside of the first and most important thing, which is know your welder well, know how it operates under a number of conditions and have a lot of practice, the settings I used were about 162 amps for the root pass. I then followed that up with cover passes at 147 amps. Where I had to really blend and make some uh, very, very wide welds, I actually did a couple of, I used the pulse uh, setting on it to get some very nice consistent width welds to merge two together. And, and I used that at 210 amps with just a couple of pulse settings. But really, mostly it's just straight current DC, taking your time, and half of it's with the pedal, uh, doing a pedal pulse, half of it is uh, just straight current. Since I was welding outside, I did have to contend with a little bit of the breeze, so I used a lot of argon. I was flowing uh, 30 to 35 cubic feet, depending on the day and where, what kind of weld it was, with my number six torch. Now that's way more gas than you would normally flow through a number six. You should be able to do like 15, uh, 15 cubic feet. You gotta flow a little bit more because in some cases it's running away or you got a light breeze and you just don't wanna fight that. And then I just love this little Everlast. The 210 EXT is fantastic. Certainly it's been great. I've run a lot of welds in it when it was doing uh, air cooled. But since I got the water cooler, you can sit there with the torch hanging over your shoulder and really just, you know, really run it to the duty cycle. Here's how I kept heat out of the frame or I kept the heat in the frame very manageable. I would melt two three foot um, rods of TIG and then I would take a break and I would spread the heat out. And I would come to the other side, melt two rods, and spread the heat. The important thing about this is just don't overheat your frame to where it wants to bend and tweak. Otherwise your body mount may not line up and you know you may end up may end up not being able to put things together. So go slow, take your time as we all know. More than anything else, know your machine, have a lot of practice and use the process that's most comfortable to you. Uh, if we were doing this six months ago, I would have migged it, but I've done a lot of TIG in the last six months and I'm really comfortable uh, running this on the running on on TIG now. <laughs> it is not yet noon and it's almost 100 degrees. So there's a lot of work left to do. The axle comes back in place, the links go back on and uh, everything gets, gets put back up and, and built at full bump. So a lot of work left to do. Shocks, hoops, bumps, all that stuff next. Before you know it, this will be back on its own weight. Uh, if you want to follow that progress in real time, find me on Instagram. Uh, as well, you can go to willametmotorandfab.com. That's where shirts, stickers, all that sort of stuff is if you want to do that. And uh, yeah, glad y'all were here. Until next time, take care.